Well, it is so good to see everybody this morning. How many of you guys have uh, experienced spring now with a couple of the sniffles, a couple of the coughs, all the things? Some of you want to admit to that? Yeah, yeah. But we made it. We made it to church today. Uh, just about everybody I know had some kind of a sniffle or some kind of a cough, but we made it. And we, we uh, kind of seem like we switched from frost to pollen, but we got it, right? And it's been such a, a wonderful, wonderful day already and just celebrating the presence of the Lord. Uh, we're going to jump right into the message today, but let me see how many you brought your Bibles with you today? Let me see. How many of you got your Bibles? Yeah. How many of you got your digital Bibles with you? Let me see those. Yeah, absolutely. How many of you got your journals with you? You got your journal with you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to dive right into that. And so if you want to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five, uh, we are rounding the bases now and, and about to finish up our series in Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians five. And so if you want to get your, your Bible ready and your, your message notes that's in your worship guide and also your journal, all the things spread out, while you do that, I want to remind you about something that Brandon said just a second ago, and that is that starting next week, we are going to have a very new, uh, or a new service time, and that is starting next week, we are going to be having, there we go, there it is, we're going to be ha- meeting at 9.15 instead of 9.30. We've had people ask us why we're doing that, and that is that if you don't eat at the cafe and if you don't have small kids, then you have no idea, but those are the two most congested areas for us in between services because we have folks checking their kids in and also checking them out. And also everybody wants to get as much food from Hope Cafe as possible because I'm pretty sure they go to heaven and get it on Saturday night and bring it to us on Sunday morning. It is so good. But we want to make sure we have plenty of of time so that we can do all of that. So just 15 minutes helps us so very much in between services. So for some of us who attend the 945 service every week, right? You know, we, we're always, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm always gonna get here early and then something always happens, right? So because of that, for you, starting next Sunday, church starts at nine, okay? That's what you need to know, and it's gonna be beginning at 915. And if you normally attend the 11, but you're here today, don't worry about it. You're good, because nothing changes at the 11 o'clock service, okay? All right, well, once again, we're, we are talking about the next part of our series, practicing resurrection. And we're kind of getting ready to finish up this part of our series. And what we've been doing is, is we've been talking about the idea that once we've received Christ in our life, once God has started to do something amazing in us, we've experienced that resurrection for ourselves. And we had three people give their lives to Christ this past Sunday as we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. Can we celebrate God for that? And so they're just now starting this journey with us. And, and after we've done that, here's the question, now what? How do we practice resurrection in our life every day? And that's what the book of Ephesians is all about. In chapter one and chapter two, you know, Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus and, and the Lord inspiring him even to write to us today saying that this is what God is doing in your life. This is who you are in Christ. And then everything that he's doing in your life, he's also doing in the life of your neighbor and how when we come together as the body of Christ, God calls us the wonderful masterpiece of God that all of the angels and all the demons and all the creation stop and gasp at what God can do through his creation when we turn our lives over to him. We are that glorious masterpiece. And then in chapter three, God's word tells us that if you could just get your mind around this, you could just see what God is doing, man, you would just grow in the love of God and you would begin to experience the multidimensional just love of God that changes all of our lives. But as he transitioned over to chapter four, he said, this doesn't happen by itself. We don't tend to just drift toward unity. We drift toward disunity and and discord and all the things. And so we have to fight for that unity. And then once he says all of that, he transitions over into what it looks like day to day. And we've just been processing through that and just kind of catch you up what we've been doing the past few weeks. It's almost like if we were in college, it's beginning progressively more complex because like, like the 101 version, the beginning of, of chapter five is he was saying, don't forget the most wonderful thing is that we have gone from darkness to light how there was a time in our life when you would have just described us as living in darkness, operating by the rules of darkness, living in just this state of just without God and confusion and all of that. But then God did something amazing in all of our lives. And now we're not walking in darkness, but we're walking in light. That's, that's 101. But then he said, the next level is, as we are walking in that light, we start to trust God with living with other people because we realize that's not always so easy. And so he's saying, we need to honor one another, give dignity to one another, just celebrate one another, challenge one another in the right setting. And that's not easy to do. And so that's like that next level. Well, then the last time we talked about this, he said the even next level that God wants you to do is to walk in that light 
Trust God with other people and then trust him to walk you toward freedom yourself. And that's not easy to do because we don't always know how to trust God with that. And so he walked us through what that looks like. And then today, what I'm so excited that God does is he helps us answer what to me would be the obvious question, how do we do this? Because there's a whole lot of do this, do that. But the question becomes, how? How do we walk out this resurrection life? How do we trust God with others? How do we trust God with what he's trying to do in ourself? How do we do it? And I just want to give this to you real quickly, and hopefully it'll make sense by the end of the message. So if you're taking notes, here's the big idea that if you don't catch anything else, this is how we do all this stuff. And that is simply this, and that is that the Holy Spirit is our secret sauce, okay? Uh, the Holy Spirit is our secret sauce, now, where did I get this idea? So I don't mean to brag, but when I was 15, I went to work at McDonald's. I know, you think more highly of me than you ought now because I worked at the Mickey D's, but I wasn't gonna work on a farm anymore, okay? I spent one summer working on a farm and said, I don't care, I'll work at McDonald's. I just don't wanna work there ever again. And by God's grace, I haven't ever, ever again because it was hard. But I went to work there, and when I started to work at McDonald's, they immediately put a colorblind guy cooking the hamburger meat. Uh, that, is, that is how bad they needed help. And pretty quickly they realized this is a mistake. So then they got me making all the sandwiches. And so making the different sandwiches is pretty easy because you got a diagram and do this. And one of the things I had to learn how to make right away was the Big Mac because the Big Mac had the secret sauce on it. And I know times have changed, but back in the day, nobody was ashamed to admit that they loved themselves a Big Mac. It seems like everybody now doesn't want to admit that they go through the drive-thru and get their Big Mac, but they didn't mind back then. We just all got it. But what I started to notice is that people didn't just put the secret sauce on the Big Mac. They would put it on the hamburgers and the cheeseburgers, and they would get a side of uh, secret sauce so they could, I guess, dip their nuggets in it. And I even had people order a fish filet, add secret sauce to it, okay? And I would just say, eh, but you do you. So there, there you go, all right? And I got to go thinking, what is in this secret sauce that it seems to be the thing that everybody has to have? And so one day when I was on a break, I go back to the stock room to try to you know, investigate the, the mystery of the secret sauce because everything had the different ingredients so you could tell people. And so I go through there and I'm looking and I, and I find the, the box that had you know, the Mac sauce as it was labeled. I get out one of the, the tubes that had the, the Mac sauce on it and the ingredients just labeled secret sauce. <laughs> they weren't going to let anybody know what it was. And so I was like, it must be magic. I don't know. I was 15. Okay. So it must be like, it just becomes what you need it to be. It's amazing. Right. And so I was just talking about how crazy it was. And then one of my coworkers was like, Brandon, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come, here. come over here. And he went and he took some ketchup and some mayonnaise and some salad dressing, started up real good. And it tasted just like it. It was amazing. Only to find out that it was only a secret to me. Like everybody else knew that the secret sauce was basically ketchup and mayonnaise and salad dressing, and it tasted amazing for most of us. I see some of you turning your noses up. That's okay. Just work with my metaphor here because hopefully it'll help you. But I started to realize it wasn't really that much of a secret. It was just a secret to me. But once everybody found out what it was, they found out that it was actually amazing on everything. Well, one of the things I've learned in my relationship with God is that it's hard. It can be really hard to do. A lot of times there's a lot of things in God's word that are not always as easy to do. They're, they can be very, very challenging. But one of the things that God has been teaching me on my journey with him is that when God saves you, he has no intention of you doing this thing called life all by yourself. But can I tell you that if you've ever seen somebody just walking in victory in their life with Jesus, they have this secret sauce, but it's actually not that much of a secret. And that is allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way in your life and to lead you and to guide you. And so the secret sauce is, there is no secret. It's the Holy Spirit and allowing him to have his way in your life. He is the one that helps us to treat others with respect. He is the one who teaches us how to walk in freedom every day. And I wanna show it to you in our text today and what the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to do and to realize he is the one that makes all of this happen. He is the secret sauce. A few weeks ago, we were reading and, and the Bible said this. It said, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off all your sinful, old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. That sounds amazing. 
and really hard at the same time. That sounds like that's gonna take all my time, all my effort. I'm never gonna get there, but I'm gonna try really hard. But then God's word says this, wait a minute. Yes, this is hard. So you need to realize instead, let the spirit, the Holy Spirit, renew your thoughts and attitudes. So immediately after he says that this is the work that God wants to do in our lives, immediately he says, by the way, you weren't supposed to do this by yourself. You're supposed to allow the Holy Spirit to help you and to renew those thoughts and those attitudes. Your job is to put on that new nature that he teaches you, to put on what he's calling you to do, which is to be created like God, which means you're gonna become more righteous and become more holy. So we were never intended to do these things alone, we were always to, intended to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in freedom continually. So now that we know that, the end of our last text was that this is why it is said, awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And then he says, so then you can be careful by how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because it will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Give thanks for everything that God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or what he's done in the name of the Lord Jesus, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so what God's word just said is that when this process of walking from darkness to light, of putting off that old nature and those old habits and those old ways of living that we, that we felt like we had to do in order to live in that darkness, those things, we need to take those off and put on what God is trying to do. But we were never intended to do that by ourselves but rather it is the Holy Spirit that renews our thoughts and renews our actions. Our job is to allow him to do that in our life. And so that's why I say the Holy Spirit is my secret weapon or he is our, he is our secret sauce, whichever works for you. So if you don't like secret sauce, he's also the secret weapon, whatever works for you. But it helps us to walk in that freedom. He helps us to walk in that freedom every day. Now, I know that last year, we did a series, an entire series, I think it was six weeks, where we talked about who the Holy Spirit is and how he empowers us in our life. And so we're not gonna have time to go into that fully. So if you would like to, you can go on YouTube and watch that and kind of really get caught up and take that next step. We're gonna make sure we're all on the same uh, page, we're gonna kind of describe to you who the Holy Spirit is in our life. Now, if you don't know this, this is the thing, is that we serve one God who exists in three persons. Think of it kind of like this. Think of your, your favorite uh, sports team you know, Alabama, or let's say UK basketball. So how many UK basketball teams are there? One, All right, let's do interactive for a second. How many UK basketball teams are there? How many players are on the team? How many UK football, uh, ba ugh, basketball teams are there? <laughs> one, there's one team with five players. And when all five players are on the court, how many teams are still playing one UK basketball team? Even though there are three or five different players on the court at the time. And they have three different functions. Like you've got the point guard, you've got the shooting guard, you've got the center, you've got whoever else, I'm a football fan, all right? You've got all these different ones. But the thing is, is that all five of them are part of one team. That's the way the triune Godhead works. You have one God existing simultaneously as three persons. Now, here's another way of looking at it, and that is the Trinity can be likened to a son. And uh, th this breaks down pretty quickly because you have, you have something finite trying to explain the supernatural. But as an idea to get your mind around it, when you look at the sun, the big round sphere of burning fire, that could be an example of the father. But then you have the sun, that's the light that you see. But then you feel the heat from the sun, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, which one of those three is the sun? All of them. Yet, are they different? Yes. And if that doesn't confuse you a little bit, you're not thinking deeply enough about it, okay? <laughs> yes, I get it. But we're trying to get the, the infinite into our finite brains. And so the best we can understand is that God exists simultaneously as three, yet one. The Colossians says that Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible God. 
Speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said that it is better for you that I go back to the Father so that the Holy Spirit can come because he will now dwell with inside of every one of you and he is the great helper. The Greek word for that was paraclete, the great helper that helps us through our life. And so what happens is, is Jesus holds his hand out to us and says, come and follow me. And so we say, yes, sir, and we grab his hand. And then as we're following him, the Holy Spirit starts to walk beside us as our helper, and he starts helping us walk in freedom every single day. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who starts to help us to walk in that freedom and starts to treat other people with kindness as he's working that out in our life. And there's so many different ways he does that. But in the text today, he talks about specifically three different ways that as we follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit then empowers us and becomes that secret sauce that makes everything work. I'm going to give these to you really quickly on what it is, and then we're going to say how the Holy Spirit does it. Here's the first thing the Holy Spirit does is as I follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit empowers me to walk in wisdom. As I follow Jesus, so I'm holding his hand. I'm holding Jesus' hand, and as I grab the hand of the Holy Spirit, he now helps me walk in wisdom because God never intended for you to try to figure this out all by yourself. He wants to walk with you every day. God's Word said it like this. It said, since the Holy Spirit is helping renew your thoughts and actions, be careful how you live and don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Why? Because we, need, we can make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. And so what God's word is saying is, is in the life we have, there's going to be opportunity to not care about how you live, to fall in this ditch or that ditch or these different things. And so as the Holy Spirit is renewing our thoughts and our actions, he helps us walk in wisdom so that we can now know what to do and what not to do. And what wisdom is, is wisdom is knowledge plus understanding. So in other words, that means you know something and you know why you should do it that way, and that equals wisdom. And so what the Holy Spirit does is he starts to walk with us and help us live on purpose, helps us to live with purpose in our life, knowing what's good, knowing what's unhealthy and what's bad, and how to navigate it. I like to say it kind of like this, that the Holy Spirit helps us walk in wisdom like a GPS for life. That's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. I'll kind of say it to you like this. When, when uh, we first moved from Alabama to Bowling Green, there's like two main ways to get there, but then there's also a whole lot of different options, right? And so we would immediately turn on our GPS and figure out how to get there. But after about four or five times, I could kind of get there on my own. And so I would try to not turn on the GPS but then I would run into traffic or I would run into like an accident or I would run into whatever. And so what I realized is the best way for me to get from point A to point B, even if I know the basic way to get there, is to keep on my GPS because the GPS is in constant contact with the satellites and it knows if there's an accident up ahead or if there's a road problem over there. And how many of you experienced this? You're on your way somewhere that you've been like a hundred times and then all of a sudden the GPS tells you to take an exit you don't normally take. And it says, there's an accident up ahead. To save time, take this detour that's actually gonna save you time in the end. Well, I didn't do that one time and it cost me two hours <laughs> because it turns out the GPS knew it better than I did. Well, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to do in all of our lives. The Holy Spirit wants to give us wisdom to make it through life. What he does is, is he guides us in our decisions. When we get up every morning and say, Holy Spirit, will you give me wisdom to know what to do? And then he's gonna give us wisdom to say, you know what? I feel like I need to do it this way instead of this way. Yeah, but we always do it that way. I know, but I just, I just feel like, that there's just a nudge in my heart to go this way, only to find out that's exactly the way that we needed to go. He convicts us of our sin. He helps us know where the potholes are in life. I don't know about you, but I've only needed to go over one major pothole in a, in a road that I normally go down before I remember it the next time and I go around it because I immediately feel like I just lost a tire, right? And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is he wants to help you avoid those different potholes. Say, hey, listen, I know that that seems good, but man, it leads to destruction. So let's go this way. He, he helps us to know our enemy, to know when the enemy is trying to attack us and go, you know what? I'm not just having a bad day, but man, there's something spiritual happening here. I need to pray and just declare my freedom in Jesus' name. And then he helps us to know when his presence is near. Sometimes God doesn't take us out of a bad situation, but he walks with us 
through those situations to help us realize what he's doing in our life. And so one of the greatest things the Holy Spirit empowers us to do is he helps empower us to walk in wisdom so that we can honor others and we can walk in freedom ourselves. The second thing the Holy Spirit empowers us to do is he empowers us to understand God's word, the promises in God's word. I don't know about you, but there have been seasons in my life when I've, had, when I've had God's word in one hand and I've had my life and my situations in the other hand, and it seemed like they could never be further apart. Like how in the world do I connect these two things? Well, one of the ways that we find out how to connect these two things is that the Holy Spirit will kind of turn the light on in our minds and will help us to see his goodness or help us to see how he is moving in our life and how through God's word, we see his faithfulness and as it applies to our life. God's word says it like this. So then don't act faultlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Well, what, where do we find out what the Lord wants us to do? Primarily through understanding his word and understanding the promises that come from his word. And I love this so much because it says, don't act thoughtlessly. And the, the Greek word for there, it thoughtlessly works. But one of the other possible definitions that works here is to say, don't act frantically. Well, can I tell you that if I don't have God's word in my life, and if I don't have the Holy Spirit constantly turning the light on to help me see how God's word fits in my life and how I can walk in his word, I have a tendency to be slightly frantic. None of y'all are like that. I know y'all walk in the constant, consistent peace of the Lord. You are, you are almost comatose all day long because you've got so much peace. You just walk through, amazing. I'm not that way. I, I walk through life like I had one too many espressos that morning, all right? If I'm not careful, I'm like, oh no, all constant. And I just need constantly for God's word to, instead of me walking through life wondering what else could go wrong, instead to understand means to realize that God is with you. And because God is with you, that means it's going to be okay. And one of the things that God's word does is God's word opens up to us that yes, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Thanks, Jesus. I, that's great. But he said, but take heart because I have overcome the world. In other words, I'm greater than everything that you're going to go through. And so it reminds me of kind of like uh, not too long ago, I, I was in my house uh, with, with my girls and it was dark outside and the power went out. Now, I don't know what it is. I, I don't have teenage boys, I just have teenage girls, but I don't know what it is. But every time the power goes out, that is their cue to scream as loud as they possibly can. And it was just them, not me. I'm not admitting to anything, okay? But it was just immediately like, like pitch black, sort of. I mean, you could still see you know, some lights from outside, but it was immediately black and they're just like, ah, oh, the power's out, we're gonna die. You know what I'm saying? And so, I was just there thinking, I'm going to calm this down with rationality. And so I just said, girls, it's the same as if it's in the light, just the lights have been turned off. That didn't work for anybody, okay? And then they get to screaming so much, I started going, well, are they being attacked now? Do I need to be upset about something, you know? And then it occurred to me, wait a minute. And so I told them, I said, girls, do you have your phone on you? They're teenagers. Of course they have their phone to them, okay? It's practically installed on their hand, right? And I said, turn the flashlight on, boom. All of a sudden, the room lit up. I was like, see, everything's here, except for the dog, it's disappeared. But other than that, everything is just fine. And it, they went from being terrified to being, oh, well, y'all wanna play a game? Might as well play flashlight hide and seek while we're here. And then all of a sudden it became a great game. Do you know that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do to all of us? We go through life sometimes and we get so distracted by dark moments and dark places and dark situations. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is, hey, can you take this and turn it on? <laughs> And all of a sudden realize it's nowhere near as bad as you think it is because for every moment of the day, I've got a promise to counteract that fear that could possibly be there. And so if you'll just you know, open this up and you'll read it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hide it in your heart so that when those bad things happen, you can turn it on and you can see that yes, there's still darkness all around you, but you don't have to be afraid of it because I'm with you and I'm for you. And that's how the Holy Spirit becomes that secret sauce in walking in this life is because number one is he gives us wisdom to know what to do and when to do it and where to do it and how to do it. And then he also lightens our way through his word so that we can see in other areas where we couldn't see. The third one, and also the one that may be most difficult for us today is that the Holy Spirit empowers me to find continual healing in my life. The Holy Spirit empowers me to walk in wisdom, 
to understand God's word and to understand the power that is in God's word every day, to, to light up all the dark places in my life, to realize that every fear I think I have has to bow its knee to the authority of God's word. And then what he does is he helps me find continual healing in my life. God's word says it like this. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's do a little work on this really quickly because this verse has been co-opted to say all kinds of things. It's been co-opted to really just talk about how we can indulge in alcohol. Can we just, just take a moment, act like we're not having a Sunday morning service, let's just have a conversation, all y'all and me, okay? We're just gonna talk real, real careful, real quick, all right? We, we have used this to say that both, we can't ever drink any kind of alcohol and we can drink all the alcohol, okay? Uh, bo both ways in between. And I don't know how you get the second one, but people do. And the thing is, is we've taken it completely out of context from what it actually is supposed to say. Now it does say some things, but also realize in the narrative that's happening is Paul is talking about something so much bigger, but at the same time, he is talking about something specific. So let's break this down this way. The most common liquid in the Middle East, or the Middle East at the time, the Mediterranean at the time in the first century, other than water was wine. The reason why is because the certain types of fruits and things that you could grow in that area, you had to immediately ferment and turn it into an alcoholic beverage or it would turn into vinegar because of the climate. And so they didn't, they didn't ferment it to turn it into alcohol so everybody could be drunk all the time. They did it so it would last a little bit longer. And it was the most common drink other than water. So it would be the modern day equivalent of coffee, okay? Uh, almost everybody drinks it. If you don't, you at least know about it, all right? And it's the same thing back then. It was extremely common. Jesus turned water into wine, all right? So it wasn't something that only happened in the Roman Empire. It happened everywhere. Everybody had it. But it also didn't have the alcoholic content it has now. Then, then it was to drink. Now it is most of the time to kind of get tipsy and get drunk. And so it was very, very different. And so what Paul is saying is, is don't be drunk with wine because it will ruin your life. Why would he say that? It's because you didn't normally drink wine to get drunk. You drank other things. You only drank wine to get drunk for one of three things. One of the reasons why is because it was something you didn't have any self-control over because you had to work at it to get drunk off wine because it, it, it was very lightly alcoholic. And so it was actually looked down at as you didn't have any self-control. The second thing was, is it was very, very frequently used with idol worship because it loosened you up to do other things. And the third one was medicinally. If you didn't have the money to go and get other types of medication, you would then drink as much as possible, not to heal yourself, but to mask the pain so that later you could find help. And so what Paul is saying is, what you're doing is you're taking something normal and something common, and because of the pain that you have, you're overindulging to mask what's really going on in your life. And so Paul is saying, having a glass of wine, I don't have a problem with that. When you're using it to medicate your pain, it will ruin your life. And so the question I have for you really quickly is, are you using anything that's common, but using it and abusing it in order to mask a pain in your life? And if so, I just wanna let you know that what the Holy Spirit will do is he will work on your life and help you find healing, but eventually he's gonna point to things that you're medicating because it's really bad and because it hurts really bad, and because it hurts so bad that you don't wanna deal with it, and so what you will do is you will continue to mask it, and continue to mask it because you're so afraid that if you let it have its moment, that you're gonna to have to feel that pain again, and you don't wanna feel that pain, and so you continue to stay drunk on something, and instead of dealing with it. And I, can I tell you, without the Holy Spirit, I don't blame you. And so what are some of the things that we tend to get drunk on to keep ourselves from dealing with the pain? There's a whole list of things. And can I go and tell you, I'm going to mark that one out because I will be honest with you and say, I have a personal problem with this one. Okay, here's, here's my Bible right, right here. This is Brandon. I always told you I would do this. I don't do this often. I trust the Holy Spirit to convict you over this. But my hope for you as your pastor would be that you would not have any alcohol in your life because I have seen it ruin so many people's lives. For every one person that says, I can have a drink and it's okay, I can show you 10 people that they have had their lives ruined. There's at least two people in my life personally that are no longer here because it poisoned their life and it eventually killed them. 
No, you gotta figure that out. You have to let the Holy Spirit convict you over that. But as someone who has had to preach a funeral of someone who poisoned their life and it destroyed them, can I tell you, it will not heal you. It will just mask the pain and it will eventually ruin your life. Let the Holy Spirit lead you on how you need to do that. But you don't have to mask your pain with alcohol. Other people, they mask their pain with social media. You know why? Because somewhere somebody lied to them and told them that they weren't good enough. They weren't beautiful. They weren't worth it. And so now, instead of using it like a normal thing and and good, you know what we do? Instead, we go and we post a selfie hoping somebody will tell us, so beautiful. Love that hair, girl. You got it going on because we don't have any self-confidence and because we don't believe what Jesus says about us. And so now we abuse it, trying to find value in something that will never heal us. It only masks the pain. That's why you have to keep posting and you have to keep showing those pictures. It's because it will never satisfy. Other, other people, success, our job, we get in a situation where we don't think we're valuable. Someone told us that we were worthless. And so now we're going to prove to them that we can reach the top of the ladder. And the whole time we don't have joy, we have pain because we're trying to convince somebody. And all we're doing is masking the pain that we don't b- believe that God says who he uh, that God says that we're enough. And so we have to make everybody else think that we're enough. Even if it's our family, if it's gaming, if it's shopping, if it's our status, if it's politics, anything that we use to cover up our pain, the Holy Spirit will eventually say, can we push that aside? And can I heal you? I don't want you. I think the Holy Spirit would say to you even right now, I don't want you to go and sit in that pain. I'm not trying to get you to relive the past. I just want to heal it. So your future is no longer defined by your past. There are people who are living 20 years after a broken place, still trying to mask the pain when the Holy Spirit is wanting to say, stop living in that lie. Can I heal it so you can live your life with joy, not running away from something that is only going to mask, but it can never heal by itself. I think for some of us, God wants to do so much in our life. That's why he says to be instead filled with the Spirit. The Greek word for that is a, is, a, is a present plural word, which means continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know why we need to be continually filled? Because we continually leak. We think of ourselves as a cup, but we're not. We're a filter. And so many times because of bumping shoulders with people in this world and hurting people hurt people and pain that we experience, all these things, there's all these nicks and cuts and wounds and holes that develop in our life because of living in this world. And so what the Holy Spirit does is he is not a river as much as he is a waterfall, constantly flowing into our life. And he's saying, whatever wound you've got, I got more than enough power to heal. Yeah, but I got one more today. Great, I got more power for you today. Well, I got this one from 20 years ago. Great, I got, I got more power for you today. You don't have to mask your pain in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it, all you gotta do is give him a chance. But I will warn you, it hurts before he heals because you have to remove that mask so you can see it for what it is. And then the Holy Spirit heals you because he loves you too much to let you stay in that broken place so that you can enjoy the things that he has and he's put in your life. And so the Holy Spirit is that secret sauce. He's he's the reason why when everybody else says nobody really changes, you're right, they don't. But the Holy Spirit changes us from the inside out. And he does it by helping us walk in wisdom, by helping us to understand the promises of God's word and have a continual waterfall of healing in our life. And so here's the question, how? How does he do that? I'm gonna give these to you really quickly. There's three ways. There's a lot of different ways that the Holy Spirit does this in our life, but there's three from this text I'm gonna give you. And here's the first one. How does the Holy Spirit empower me? Number one is by spending time in his presence together and alone. The Holy Spirit empowers me when I spend time in his presence together and also alone. God never intended for you to go through this life without power but he wants to give it to you in his presence. God's word says it like this. And so let him be that continual feeling, filling and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves as a group, but then also making music to the Lord in your heart. And so what Paul is talking about here is he's talking about these different types of music that we can make. And there's different ways that we can worship the Lord. But he says, hey, you do it together, but also there's a worship that happens by yourself 
as well. That's why it's so important for us to come together as a church body and to worship the Lord together. We're not interested in introducing you to the, to the latest, greatest worship songs. We're, inter we're interested in us entering into God's presence together so that the Holy Spirit can, can start working on us and giving us that wisdom and giving us that illumination of God's word and providing that healing for us. And there's three different ways that Paul lays out that we can do this. And this is just, just extra three different ones is one would be Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms primarily were things you would find in God's word. There would be the different, different places of, of just, you know, the, the Psalms written by David or Solomon or, or Asaph or these different ones. And it would be mainly talking about God from his word. And we do some of that around here. Like for instance, you know, Isaiah talks about the, the name of God who would be called wonderful counselor, mighty God. And so when we sing, like, sing songs like, you know, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, our King. It's like singing the Psalms singing straight out of God's word, singing about who he is. Then you've got hymns. These are, these are testimony songs. These are songs where, where we are testifying of God's goodness. We sang some of those this morning. One of my favorite is just where I could never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. That's just the testimony of God's word and what he is doing. You know, it's one of the ones that we, we sang this morning, just, I could never stop praising you for all that you've done, singing the, the hymn, the testimony of what God's done. But my favorite is spiritual songs, because that's a song that comes out of your heart to the Lord. Now, that might be a song that you make up, you know, just, just thinking about what's going on in your life. But for me, a lot of times, because I am no songwriter, it's, it's a song that God has put on my heart that I've been listening to, and it just becomes my anthem for just a season of my life. The one I've been going through lately is just, you know, worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And I can't tell you how many times I'll be at work, I'll be in between meetings, I'll be driving somewhere, and when I just get quiet for a moment, I can just feel that song just, just, just bubbling up inside of me. It's worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And as I start to sing that song, I start to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit start to bubble up inside of me. And I, I can feel his goodness start to surround me. And I, I start to realize that, man, God is near and God is close and God is active in my life. And it's, that song changes. And it's, and it's my song to the Lord that may not mean anything to any of you. I had one one time that stayed in my life for like five years. It was this old song. It was, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus says the Lord. And even in this moment, I can remember those dark days when all I had was that song. And it reminded me that I still wasn't all alone. And that song just began to just continually remind me of his presence. And when I needed wisdom, that song would come up in my heart and in my mind. And when I needed to know God's word in my life, that song would come up. And then when, I'd, when God would start to unmask a broken place in me that I'd been hiding, that song would come up. And it was the Holy Spirit's way of saying, hey, hey, remember me. Remember me. I'm doing this. I'm in your life. It's okay. Keep going. Keep going. And that's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us. But where do we learn those songs? When we come together. And then when we worship him, alone. The second way that the Lord does this is that he helps us to cultivate a thankful heart toward him. He helps us to cultivate that thankful heart toward him. One of the things that happens in my life is as I start singing those psalms, those hymns, those spiritual songs, and I'm, you know, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. And I'm just singing through that song. What the Holy Spirit does in my life is he starts to do this when God's word says that then give thanks for everything to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And what he starts to do is the Holy Spirit starts to teach me that though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid because he walks close beside me. And what he begins to teach me is that as I'm singing those songs and I begin to realize how good God is, the reason why God has put that other one on my mind so much, you know, worthy is your name, is I start thinking about, God, how worthy you are. That look at all the things you've done in my life. Look at how faithful you've been and look at all the wonderful things in the past you've done. And, and then when I start to think about that, then I start to be thankful for what God is doing and I start to see how big God is. I start to realize that God may not always take away my dark moment, but he gives me the strength to walk through it. And what I've realized is he doesn't always take away the bad moment, but he does take away the fear of it because he's with me. And so I realized that I may have to walk through those difficult days, but when I start being thankful for what he's done and for who he is in my life, he takes away the sting of the fear of what I'm gonna have to walk through because I learned to trust him even more. Even when he, he starts to unveil some of those broken places in my life and I start to see them for what they are. And I, God, I, I don't wanna wade into those dark places because they were painful and I barely made it out with my life. And I start remembering, but wait a minute, I remember how good you are. I remember how faithful you are. I remember how you saved my life so many times. And God, if you've been faithful then, I don't wanna walk through that, but I'm not afraid of it because you're gonna be with me every step of the way. And that's what God wants to do maybe in some of our lives is to realize that we were never intended to do life alone. That the secret sauce of Christianity is the Holy Spirit in our life. And he empowers us to walk with wisdom he empowers us to understand his word. And if you're ready for it, is Christianity 401 is to stop masking your pain and instead allow him to heal it one small step at a time. And he does it through encouraging us to get into his presence, to sing and to let our hearts go and to worship him. And then when we do that, we start to see him for who he is and we develop a thankful heart and to realize that though he may not save us from a dark road, he will remove the fear of it because of his faithfulness. And then to realize number three is that by walking with each other because of our love for Jesus, how does the Holy Spirit empower me? By walking with each other because of our love for Jesus. That God never intended for you to go through this hard thing called life all by yourself. And I love how God's word says this. It's like, I need, I need you to understand this is what God wants you to do. And then how is he going to do it? By when we sing and we worship together, and then that song is going to come up in your own heart. And then as you develop that thankfulness, you're no longer going to be afraid of what you're going to go through. And then God's word says this, and further, like this isn't going to be for everybody. Like you might not be ready for this yet, but if you really want to see what else the Holy Spirit can do, submit. Another word for that would be serve one another out of your reverence or your honor for Christ. So you really want to see what else can happen is allow your brother and sister in Christ to get involved in the process. Let them help you through your life. Because I think life looks a lot like this right here. Like it's this big, nasty, blurry thing, right? And, and it, it has good moments, but it also has sharp edges. And, and, and here's me all by myself trying to pick up this whole big thing called life. And for you, life may, might be schedules and, and conflicts and relationships and trying to do things in your life and all these different things. And you're just trying to manage it all by yourself. And then what you find out is that the Holy Spirit wants to be that secret sauce in your life. And he wants to come alongside you and, and he wants to fill you up with his presence and then fill you with that thankful heart. And, and it's almost kind of like, you know, you're, you're, were broken, but now you can be like this. This is the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is that thankful heart that he helps you to grow. But if you notice, there's still some gaps. There's still some places in your life. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do in all of our lives is he wants us to learn how to rest in his presence where he can heal us. He wants us to be thankful so we can see that he's so able but then he wants us at some point to lock arms with our neighbor to realize that true healing is probably also gonna come with having other people in our life as well. It reminds me of just this past week, I, um, I had the opportunity to um, 
be a line judge at my daughter's volleyball game, and that shows you how bad they needed help, okay? Because I had no idea what I was doing, and I was, I was waving the flag when I wasn't supposed to and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I was, I was watching the other team go, and there was this little girl on the other team, and, I, and I've seen my daughter's team do this too, but I, I saw it Thursday night. And there was this, every time the ball would go out of bounds on my end, she'd be like, hey, hey, let me have the ball, let me have the ball. It's like, in my mind, I'm going, it's not your serve. And she didn't care. I, Give me the ball. <laughs> Here, you care about it way more than I do, right? And she'd get that ball and she'd, she'd sit there and she'd make sure it was good. And she'd go over to the person who was about to serve and she'd say, you got this, you're awesome. Show them what you can do. Ugh. And then they would hit it over. She said, see, girl, I knew you could do that. Watch out, you better, you better watch yourself. I mean, she'd just, just celebrate them. And then if they would miss it, I'm talking about just hit it way over the other court. She'd say, oh, you're saving some for the rest of us. You're saving some points for the rest of us. You'll get it next time. You got this. And it was awesome. I, I found myself wanting to give her the ball just to see what she was going to do. She was like cheering on the court. And it turns out that she actually like didn't even care to like hit the ball. She was cheering everybody else on. And she would just say, coach, you better get her out of here because there ain't going to be none left for the rest of us. I mean, she was just, just cheering everybody on. And as I was watching her do that, I was like, that's what people can do in our life. Like you can't take my serve for me. Like I've got my own dark places to deal with. I've got my own private battles that nobody else knows about. And you might not even know about them. You can't take my serve. But you know what you can do? You can cheer me on as I do. Hey, you got this. You're going to make this. Oh, you messed that one up. Don't worry. You're going to get it the next time. You keep going. I, I can't serve for you. But what I can do is I can cheer you on while you go serve. And if you miss it, I'm going to pick you up. I'm going to dust you off. Go do it again. And that's the power of the body of Christ. That God's word says, hey, listen, what the Holy Spirit wants to, you to do is he wants to empower you. He wants to move in your life. He wants you to experience his presence. He wants you to then not only experience his presence, but then have that thankful heart to realize God can do anything. And then he wants you to walk alongside somebody and be their biggest cheerleader. Man, I can't take this for you. You're the one that's gonna have to walk toward freedom, but I can stand right here with you and cheer you on. And every time you fall down, I'm gonna pick you back up. I wanna dust you off. You know why? Because God is for you and not against you. And you might be your neighbor's next miracle because of what the Holy Spirit does through you. Because you can't carry their darkness, but you can cheer them on as they give it to the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you in my life, that's what I've noticed. Is that I know I... I was kind of joking around saying that the Holy Spirit is my best friend and, you know, and he's my secret weapon. But the reality is, is the Holy Spirit is my best friend. He's not just a secret sauce. He's, he's not just whatever. But I have learned that he's always there. Last week, I, I had the wonderful opportunity to, to share my story about what God did in my life. And you know, for years, growing up in a Christian home, I'd heard about the gospel. I had a lot of doubts, I had a lot of fears, a lot of concerns, a lot of questions. And as I said last week, finally someone helped me see the love that God had for me. But I was so afraid that when I got up the next day, it would all be gone. Like, how do I do this? I've watched Christians all my life. It almost seems supernatural that they're able to walk in freedom the way they are and, and how they're able to forgive other people and all, how in the world do I do that? And so I went to bed that night, terrified that I was gonna wake up the next day and I was still gonna have problems. Cause I thought when I woke up the next day, I was gonna be just like ready to go to heaven. And two things happened that shocked me the next morning. I woke up and I still had issues. I still had things I needed to forgive. I still had areas I needed to walk in forgiveness over. But the second thing was that I realized I was no longer alone. I felt on the inside of me that God was with me and that no matter how hard it was gonna be, no matter what I was gonna have to walk through, I was never going to have to do it by myself, but that the Lord was gonna be with me every step of the way. Well, I've been a Christ follower now for a long time. Can I tell you that I have tried to do life without inviting the Holy Spirit into my life? And it is crippling. It's difficult. It's hard. It's impossible. And then I've invited the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just want you stronger in my life today. And can I tell you, life is still difficult and hard and complex. 
but possible because he makes a way. And what I wanna encourage you today, what would your life look like if you realized that you never have to go through a day alone? You never have to wander by yourself. That the Holy Spirit wants to walk through you, with you through anything and everything you're going through. That he wants to be that best friend in your life. If you're a Christ follower, he's already there. You just have to invite him to come in even more, to increase his presence in your life. If you're not a Christ follower in here, I'm so glad that you're here. In just a moment, the band is gonna come up and they're gonna lead us in one more worship song. And there's a prayer on your connect card that if you can look at that prayer and you can pray that to God and mean that in your heart, repent of your sin, the Holy Spirit wants to come and live on the inside of you and be that best friend that you're never, ever alone. And he walks with you and he does life with you and he helps you. And that's what God offers to every one of us because he may not take away the dark road you're walking on, but he will take away the fear of it. Because when he walks close beside me, I can walk through anything. And as we get ready to pray together today, the band's gonna lead us in that song of worship that we do. And I wanna ask you this question. What is the Holy Spirit trying to do in your life? Is he trying to take away something that you've been masking? something that is fine all by itself, but you've been abusing it because you're trying to medicate a pain in your life? Is the Holy Spirit trying to point a finger at that? Hey, can we talk about this? Can we talk about this? Yeah, but I like this. Yeah, but we both know why you like this. You don't like it because of what it is. You like it because of what it's medicating. And what I wanna do is I don't wanna medicate it. I wanna heal it. The Holy Spirit is not a morphine shot. He's an antibiotic shot. He wants to heal you, but you gotta be willing to put that aside and let him do surgery. Is that what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life today? Is the Holy Spirit trying to bring healing? Is the Holy Spirit trying to bring confidence, take away fear? Can I tell you, he is your best friend. He is your helper. And he is concerned about whatever is on your heart right now. And in just a moment, I want us just to have a moment of honesty. Just say, God, here's, here's what it is. Whatever it was that came to your mind when I said that, that, maybe that's the thing. He never reveals anything he doesn't also intend to heal. Maybe that's the thing. And I don't know how you need to bring it to him. Maybe just where you're, where you're gonna be in the moment while we're worshiping, you just need to lift it to him. Maybe you need to come up here to the altar. It's just a symbol of just laying it down at his feet. God, I trust you with this place in my life. Whatever you need to do. But is it time to trust the Holy Spirit in your life? Let's pray together. And then let's do business with Jesus today. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your presence and your mercy in our lives. Thank you, God, that you see us and you know us. And I truly believe in this moment that you never reveal anything you don't also intend to heal. And that in this place, God, you're speaking to hearts. You're moving in lives. You're challenging us. Lord, you're, you're asking us to take a step of faith. Lord, for those of us who we don't have a relationship with you, Lord, in this moment, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring freedom. Lord, as they pray that prayer, as they repent of their sin and they give their lives over to you, I pray that you will do the impossible and that, Lord, you will set us free as we give our lives to you. And for those of, maybe those in here that are being challenged to lay something down so that you can heal something in their life, I pray for courage to take the next step. For some of us, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, it's time to go deeper. It's time to go further. Will you trust me with everything? We say in faith, God, that we do. Because in your presence, we have nothing to fear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me all over the house this morning as we sing one more song of worship? There's gonna be a prayer team in the back who'd love to pray with you. I want to ask you this question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? And how do you need to respond to him today?